But the Glad business is committed to doing more with less. We are thinking about the full spectrum of reduce, reuse, and recycle. Our biggest scope one and scope two impacts on global warming are around manufacturing energy. So our focus is on energy renewability and on zero waste to landfill manufacturing. So one of the roles that we play in household waste management is helping make it easy for consumers to sort properly so that they end up in a consistent divided waste stream that can then be reused by manufacturers or other end users and create value streams that are stronger than they have been historically. Welcome to Mindful Businesses presented by Sarani and I'm your host, Vidya Ayer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic and environmental practices. It was a crisp Friday morning in fall and in my inbox, I'd received an email from a PR firm pitching a guest who worked for one of the largest plastic bags and plastic container manufacturer in the United States. As most of our guests know, we have in the past featured guests who are trying to eliminate plastic use and waste or finding alternatives to plastic and here was a guest suggested to me who actually manufactures plastic bags and containers. The brand was Glad. Most Americans are familiar with their trash bags, cling wraps and plastic containers. I reread the message and decided I wanted to learn how a company as large as Glad can help reduce the problem. Plastic and its advantages are innumerable and in many applications for now indispensable. We talked with the passionate Eric Schwartz, general manager of the Glad Products Company, about how his company is committed to reduce, reuse and recycle. The commitment to reduce is the most important, he says. Plastic gets a bad rap because of its energy and consumption and how it's manufactured and by its very nature, it doesn't really biodegrade. Glad company has achieved zero waste to landfill in their facility and uses 100% recyclable energy in their North American plants. In their household management, they help by educating customers to sort plastic and overall reducing the use of plastic by using smart product design without compromising on the performance. With better household separation process, manufacturers like Glad will have access to the used plastic as against virgin plastic. Eric mentions that 38% of US households don't have recycling and Glad has partnered with a startup called Recyclops with the target of bringing recycling to 100,000 homes in the next two years. Let's learn about GLAD's sustainability journey from Eric Schwartz, general manager of the GLAD products company, doing more to waste less. He joins us from Berkeley, California. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Vidya. So I interviewed a guest just yesterday who wants the world to become plastic free. She mentioned that 91% of the plastic that we send out to be recycled doesn't get recycled. How do we start tackling this huge problem? That's a great question. You know, we believe that at GLAAD, we believe that we can have a major influence on how consumers think about and treat waste from the household on out. And as the largest brand in household waste management, we are trying to have an impact on how consumers think about these problems and act. The idea of plastic waste is a problem for us too. And we believe we can be at the center of helping to solve it. The numbers of recycled 
the percentages of recycled plastic are way, way too low. Mm -hmm. And we also know that there are places where plastics as a substance have unique roles to play in solving problems, medical applications as moisture barriers, et cetera. Um, so we recognize that there are places where plastics are necessary, but there is a huge amount that can be done about how much plastic ends up in a waste stream and ultimately for the most part in landfill, if not worse, and we can play a central role in helping to minimize uh, that waste. I mentioned this in some of our earlier episodes. Plastic was invented as a sustainable alternative to using natural resources. So is it the case that too much of anything good can end up being bad? It is certainly true that plastics can play a role in minimizing global warming potential, for example, in the world. And so there are cases where that's true. We have products where we have explored alternative natural substances that have a negative impact on global warming potential or greenhouse gas emissions and in the end have a carbon footprint that's not an improvement, and we have not gone in those directions for that reason. So it is certainly true that while alternative materials are interesting and can be major solutions to our waste challenges, it's also true that sometimes it's hard to beat materials that are super efficient, especially when unique properties are required, like moisture barriers or you know medical grade protection of equipment. But the GLAD business is committed to doing more with less. And as we think about what unique role we can play in helping to solve waste problems, including plastic waste problems, we are thinking about the full spectrum of reduce, reuse, and recycle. So finding ways to reduce material usage for us is even more important than finding alternative materials to use. Sometimes the alternative materials provide benefits, and then it's interesting to move businesses there, provide options for consumers that are willing to make trade-offs. And ideally, as a business, our role is to minimize trade-offs so that consumers can make the more environmentally sustainable choice. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we are looking at possibilities to reduce material usage or reduce virgin material usage that have a much bigger impact on ultimate waste and global warming potential of usage of the product category of solving the problems that the category is designed to solve. So that's the biggest area that our business is focused on. So it's really unusual for mindful businesses to have a plastic manufacturer on our show. Why does plastic get such a bad rap? Let's start with how it's produced. What is the impact of plastic production on our planet? Plastic can be an energy intensive process to produce it. And that's one of the reasons we've been focused on the energy usage within our manufacturing. Um, it also is a product category that creates something that's designed to last. By definition, plastics were created to retain their usability. And when they retain their usability, that sometimes can create a problem. The end of life is not managed well. Mm -hmm. Those are two areas that are important for us to look at minimizing the environmental impact and global warming potential of the plastics that we're involved with. Another area is in the manufacturing process, even beyond the energy used, which we have been working to address and actually made great strides in addressing energy usage in our manufacturing environment. There's also the waste streams of any manufacturing operation that manufacturers have to be conscious of. Our biggest scope one and scope two impacts on global warming are around manufacturing energy. So our focus is on energy, renewability, and on zero waste to landfill manufacturing. And I am proud to say that the GLAD business in all its North American operations is made in zero waste to landfill facilities and has been for years. So that's part of our commitment to sustainability. We also have made great progress during the pandemic, actually, in securing 100% renewable energy in our North American plants. And those two moves alone are huge benefits um, to our footprint and our direct impact on the environment. 
So let's talk about what are the different types of plastics that are there. You know, different plastics have different properties, how easily they can be recycled, and their impact. What are the different types of plastics? We all are familiar with the terminology that's embedded in plastics in North America with the coding of one through seven and the, the circular arrows there. So those represent familiar different types of plastic from the HDPE acronym, the PET acronym, the LLDPE acronym. Um, those are less familiar, but they all fall into one of those seven buckets. And those buckets are all available potentially for recycling, but we know the numbers are very low. And the numbers for recycling, which in the US, I've heard numbers as well in the single digits, are far too low. Mm -hmm. And they're specifically low because of the complexity and confusion that consumer users and even manufacturers that are making choices about which plastics to use in their products and how to combine them for properties that consumers are looking for. The complexity that's created by that landscape is part of the problem at the end of the day. So one of the solutions is for manufacturers and consumers to have simple heuristics about what to do when they're building products, if they're a manufacturer. And if you're in your consumer, in your kitchen, finishing up a yogurt carton or a beverage for, that's designed for portability and good containment and temperature retention and all those things we love as consumers, to know what to do to put that back into a waste stream that can be reused again or optimally used in its end of life. Are some of these plastics with the numbers three, six, you know, are some of them easier to recycle than the others? Yeah, some of them are less complex in recycling than others. The single biggest driver of recycledness, if that's a word, <laughs> the single biggest driver of the percentages of waste streams that are actually reused um, is the simplicity and the ability to sort. So one of the roles that we play in household waste management is helping make it easy for consumers to sort properly. It starts with understanding an incredibly complex landscape that differs by geography because a municipality's rules and capabilities are different from their neighbors and different from another regions, and certainly country to country, they're different. Um, so helping consumers decode and understand how to treat their household goods as they're done with their use so that they end up in a consistent divided waste stream that can then be reused by manufacturers or other end users and create value streams that are stronger than they have been historically. One of the biggest challenges of plastics recycling is plastics are not all the same thing. Plastic is a very general word, like natural products. And so if you've got number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five all mixed together, you don't have anything you can reuse at its highest value usage. Mm -hmm. And so separation in the home is a key component of reusability. And another key component is making sure that you minimize from the very source, the usage of all materials, including plastics, and that involves smart product design. So GLAD, as an example of this, GLAD has invested in a smarter design for trash bags to be made with less plastic compared to leading competitors without sacrificing strength and performance. The reason people buy trash bags can't be sacrificed if they're going to make the more sustainable choice. So that means we're using, depending on the comparison, seven to 22% less plastic in every bag that we create. And it's still in many cases, stronger and higher performing than its competitor. That gives us a situation where I can proudly say that when consumers choose GLAD instead of a competitive bag product that uses more plastic in it, they are saving, and our calculation shows 100 million pounds of plastic is preventable from going to landfill just based on the simple choice of choosing GLAD versus other products on the shelf for trash bags. Now, that's just one example. 
One of our roles as a brand is to help consumers understand where there are choices that they can make that can have a positive impact on the environment and don't involve trade-offs. And when those choices are obvious to consumers, how to behave when sorting, which product to choose to make a better for the environment decision, and what to do with their waste streams, individual consumers can have a much more positive impact, not only on the environment, but also on the circularity of materials usage. You talked about product design and some of the plastics are more recyclable than the others. Is it possible instead of having, I don't know, one to six that we have now, could we just have three of them and all manufacturers go towards those three. Sorting is easy. I'm sorting three versus six or seven. And everybody makes a deliberate effort from the manufacturer to the recyclers, the consumers, and that can maybe in some ways streamline and reduce the waste. The idea of minimizing the types of usage is one potential solution. Separation is a good, consistent separation so the waste streams are simple and consistent is another very powerful solution. And I would say as well, the choice to use less material is by far the biggest impact solution that is possible for not just consumers to make, but also manufacturers and retailers. So basically just reduce what you use than trying to recycle, just try to reduce the amount of raw materials that you use that to begin with. Absolutely. And for us as consumers, that's one of our biggest impacts. For us as manufacturers, that's one of our biggest impacts as well, if not the biggest impact when we're talking about material intensive production processes. So for GLAD as a household waste management company, when we're making food protection products or when we're making waste management products like kitchen trash bags, we are constantly thinking about how to deliver the properties that consumers require of the category using as little material as possible mm-hmm. and of the material we need to use, how to minimize our usage of virgin materials to create waste streams of the specialized materials that plastics represent. So for example, films and flexibles tend to be different types of plastics than let's say a bottle that you might drink from. And when you are using films and flexibles, if a waste stream that is made up of that kind of plastic can be kept pure or separated and then reused, then you're really talking about reducing as well. And the end result, there's some logistics in between and certainly some behavior change that's required, but the end result is a reduction in virgin material usage. And so we are developing much more education on the consumer side and more practices around us even as a material buyer with those who supply us with plastics that help encourage the value streams that can be created by plastics, which at the end of the day, a clean and unmixed, let's say, a clean and pure value stream coming from flexibles, for example, or coming from bottles, those can be reused very, very easily in manufacturing processes when you're not mixing seven different types of plastics together. So the short-term solution to plastics recycling is to have a viable end market of as pure streams as possible through the consumer household separation and the waste management process so that manufacturers like GLAD can buy plastic that has been used before instead of buying virgin plastic. And that brings numbers way down and encourages recycling way up as well. This is opposite of what the single stream recyclers say. They said single stream recycling has increased the amount of garbage or trash that is recycled. So you are saying we should go back to sorting? I'm comfortable with that because every time I mix it, I feel that I'm not sure, is this really going anywhere? So are you sort of saying we should start sorting and putting our plastic bottles, newspapers, 
Yeah, I think we're all confused by the tasks of sorting. So where single stream recycling is enabled by material recycling facility or MRF capabilities to redivide those single streams coming out of the household, that is a simple way to encourage recycling of a non-recycling household. So let's talk about GLAD. It's a subsidiary of the Clorox company. So GLAD is managed by the Clorox company. It is a piece of a varied portfolio that Clorox has. And it's also a unique consumer packaged goods partnership between two manufacturers. Uh, We have participation from Procter & Gamble and participation from the Clorox company in a joint venture that helps us bring the best of innovation from two best-in-class innovators into the GLAD household waste management business. So what are the different products that GLAD offers? The classic ad is, don't get mad, get GLAD. Remember from the 90s, maybe? I don't know if it's still... Yeah, that sounds about right. 90s and 2000s. Yeah. What are the various products? So GLAD is the nation's leading choice for household waste solutions, and our specialties really are kitchen and outdoor trash bags and food protection products. Anytime I have leftovers, either I'm putting it in my Pyrex with the plastic lid, or if I don't have a lid, I have to put cling wrap, and I have to throw it. There is nothing that I can do. I cannot reuse the cling wrap. But there are some solutions. So does GLAD offer any solutions with regards to casserole covers using silicon? Our current product portfolio includes a range of wraps and containers. Silicon is not included in our current portfolio, but this is a great example of material usage. So as you think about GLAD's standard cling wrap or our more advanced product, which is called press and seal, which seals things that other things can't. So if you're like me, I love avocados. Once you cut off half the avocado, you want to seal it up tight so the other half is still in great shape when you use it. Our press and seal material is designed like a wrap, but also to stick to itself when you want it to. And so you can secure items and remove food waste from a waste stream at dramatic levels. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, the material usage to make wraps is a tiny fraction of the material usage to make more permanent products that can be washed and reused. So the net global warming potential, again, is for years a significant improvement. And that's one of the reasons that we are active in our flexible plastics which are not all the way to the level of recyclability any of us want to see them, but are well below the global warming potential of manufacturing uh, heavy products that are for reuse. So it's a great example of a situation where thin products that serve purpose and are recycled are actually the higher usage of materials and the lower impact on the environment. Explain to our listeners what is scope one, scope two, scope three. How does GLAD handle scope one? And give an example of what exactly is scope one. The simple way I think about it is scope one and two are our controllables as a manufacturer. So my mantra is control the controllables. And the simple example of where we have had the best leverage at controlling those controllables is what choices we make in product design. So I talked about reducing material usage. What choices we make in energy utilization. So I talked about going to 100% renewable energy usage in our manufacturing operations. And then, of course, what choices we make to minimize waste streams from our direct manufacturing operations. So zero waste to landfill facilities where there's nothing leaving the facility that goes to landfill. And the vast majority, we aim for over 90% and we're certified above that level by third parties, is going into usable recycling streams that are reused in industrial or consumer processes. Mm -hmm. So those are examples of our controllable scope one and scope two. Our scope three emissions, as we think about the challenge of getting to net zero, which is part of the company's commitment and the brand's commitment, over the longer period of time, requires our supplier base, the ups, what they call the upstream part of our business, to 
first get better at calculating and then get better at improving and contributing to the improvements that we can make in our own house, right, in our own shop. So an example of that would be where is the plastic being sourced from? And the biggest controllable there is a reduction in virgin materials. There are other controllables. Uh, bio uh, feedstocks are one uh, with the right logistics. They can be an improvement for the environment. The idea of creating less waste upstream so that the manufacturing process of plastic pellets, for example, which is the feedstock that we use in our manufacturing operations, can be minimized. That's another example of scope three. So a range of examples of scope three. And then there are additional scopes around consumer usage phases where consumers may be able to make impacts on the waste streams that are happening around the usage of the product. So for example, recycling in the household a product versus throwing it into a end of life situation that is worse than that is an example of how the consumer can make a difference. And those are, to simplify, those are the scope four and five uh, things after it leaves our manufacturing and when the product itself has moved into someone else's control. Mm -hmm. We have a role to play in influencing the entire spectrum of emissions. So scope one and two is where we've started. We've made great progress on those controllables. There's still progress to be made. The content of our packaging is in the 90s of renewable, recyclable, compostable, which is our target is to get to 100%. And we're on a path to get there uh, in just a few years, but we're still stuck in the 90s and not at 100. That's an example of a progress we We've made, but more progress that's needed from us. But we believe we can have a significant role to play in helping push upstream the focus on sustainability that we have within our organization and help to push downstream the clarity of understanding about what has a real impact. And for example, the usage of some of our food protection products, which to some consumers is counterintuitive. Using plastic can be better for the environment, but using plastic wrap to cover and protect many foodstuffs actually reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And so we have a role to play to help consumers understand the real impacts of their actions and provide trade-off free choices to the consumer so that they can choose the more sustainable option. And that we think is how we can make the biggest difference, education and reducing the trade-offs. I hadn't heard about scope four and five. The way I remember what is scope one, scope two, scope three is burn, buy, and beyond. Scope one is what you burn, your in-house, and scope two is what you buy, the energy, and things like that. Beyond is your downstream suppliers who come to you. How long did it take for GLAD to become 100% renewable energy? in all their plans. A story that stretches back to our the commitments that we made at the beginning of our Ignite strategy, which is a set of commitments we made in late 2019. So it's a little over a couple of years um, since we started down the road of what we call Ignite, which was our strategy refresh. And included within that as a company, the Clorox company made began down the path of a series of commitments around plastic, energy, and other areas where we could make a difference. Mm -hmm. The specific 100% renewable energy transition in our North American plants was enabled in, we can come back to you with the date, but it was enabled in early last year, if I'm not mistaken, and we can get you more accurate view to make sure we're not misstating. But that commitment was based on a virtual power purchase agreement where we helped contribute to the certainty that is required in order to build a greenfield renewable energy and committed to the price point and the longevity of purchasing that allowed a commitment to generation of energy. And it's those kinds of agreements that make change in the power grid and those kinds of agreements that we believe can make changes beyond our direct influenceables also in how we source plastics and how materials move from our plants to our retailers and in all sorts of scope one, two, three and beyond uh, impacts on the environment. So how do you measure? You talked about how sometimes it's really hard to measure. How do you measure it? 
Our best method of measuring our impact on the environment, soup to nuts, is called LCA, life cycle analysis. So we use life cycle analyses in our categories and GLAAD invested in third-party life cycle analysis capability that helps us understand our current product set and how it compares to our the competitive choices offered on the marketplace. And any innovation that we do is also given an LCA analysis so that we understand the life cycle impact of a new way to solve waste management problems for consumers. And we use that as a litmus test on the kinds of innovation we think are exciting to bring to market, either because they reduce greenhouse gas emissions or because they solve another problem without making greenhouse gas emissions worse. Mm -hmm. And also a litmus test on, are we going far enough, fast enough? What more can we do? So sometimes the analysis itself, a life cycle analysis can help us understand where the business can have a real impact or where an element of the business needs to change to have a real impact. And life cycle analysis has been a critical tool in helping us understand, for example, the importance of virgin plastic reduction and the importance of developing manufacturing capability that can accommodate plastics that are not original virgin plastics the importance of working with suppliers to understand how they can develop their capabilities to provide us virgin-like materials that are not virgin plastics so that our manufacturing processes can up our percentages. And last, the importance of how we source non-virgin materials. One of our challenges as we've gone down this path that began with life cycle analysis is recognizing that for our plastic material, there is not enough of a waste stream that we can access and put back into the products themselves. So we would like to increase the recycled content in our bags beyond what the market currently has available. And the recognition of that problem is one of the unlocks of circularity in any economy. If you've got a buyer that can't buy and a seller that isn't yet preparing their material to sell to a buyer, recognizing those disconnects allows us to identify circular opportunities that again can reduce our numbers, can reduce our virgin plastic material usage and as a side effect, can increase the value of recycled plastics so that those percentages get much higher than they are today. When you do the life cycle analysis, there's a lot of talk about blockchain, the ledgers that go along with that. Is that part of how you do your analysis? Our analysis, for the most part, doesn't require blockchain to make good, very close estimates of what general impacts are. And there is so much low-hanging fruit from understanding life cycle analysis at a general level that blockchain is a requirement over the long term of getting much further down the road. But we can make big improvements based on what we understand today. And that does not include, for the most part in our markets, blockchain technology applied in the real world yet. So you talked about access to recycled plastic to use in your products, which perform as well as the virgin plastic. I read an article, I think it was fairly recent, in December 2021, P&G were facing similar shortages to reach their sustainability goals. So this is a question where there is so much waste, but it's not reaching you in the correct form in a timely manner. How can we solve that? It involves a huge amount of cooperation. You know, one of the most exciting things about the sustainability world today to me is how interested businesses are in working this problem. The next step is how interested businesses are in working with each other to solve integrated end-to-end -end way some of these gaps that we're talking about. And this is a perfect example. Waste streams that are looking for an end market and end market that's looking for what were waste streams need to be connected as often as possible. And this is the example of plastics. For me, it's more important to connect those waste streams so that I can get virgin quality and build 
a lot more into my bags today than to think about how do we go back to the drawing board and recreate our entire economy based on fewer materials. Both are potential solutions over the long term, but over the short term, and we don't have long to wait, over the short term, we want to make sure that we can immediately connect the pipes, per se, on waste streams that can be used and interest in those waste streams. So for us, that means the purity of waste streams, which doesn't require blockchain or track and trace to do better at tomorrow. It requires separated streams, cleaning capabilities, and connecting buyers and sellers with a commitment to the sustainability impacts that circular economies can have. You know, most municipalities do not take plastic. So we actually have a separate service called Rabbit Recycling, which takes all our plastic. It's a small startup, very, very cute. They're just a bunch of young kids who leave tubs on your porch. You fill them up. They swap out the tubs how, you know, on a regular basis or on a as-needed basis. They have different programs. And you have a shortage in the recycled plastic. And I have to pay for this additional service, right? Why are the municipalities not seeing value in trying to make money out of this? So I'm willing to pay $25 a pickup for this. So depending on the household, and it can easily run to a few hundreds. Why would a government or a municipality not see value in this? Yeah, first, let's start with the scale of the problem. So by our statistics, 38% of U.S. households do not have access to basic recycling pickups, single stream, multiple stream, or otherwise through their municipalities. So you are not alone. And particularly in more rural environments, there are challenges, but there are challenges as well in urban environments, multi-unit environments, as an example. If you live in a high-rise building or just a large multi-unit where the trip to recycling is problematic for you on an everyday, once an hour or once a week basis, the idea of accessibility to recycling is a major problem and the major solution to getting our percentages up. Mm -hmm. So yes, municipalities own a piece of this. And in many cases, municipalities can play a critical role, but where they don't, startups are starting to step in and fill the gaps. And GLAD is active with partnerships in this area, one of which it sounds like something similar to what you're experiencing in your house. We partnered over a year ago now with a technology-enabled sustainability and recycling startup called Recyclops. And the goal there is to expand to more than 100,000 households over the next couple of years that are currently without recycling options. Along the way, we're also experimenting with supplemental services because many cities, once they start recycling, maybe they add paper or number two plastic, but they don't add the full stream of recycling services. And they may not have the capability to do single stream because single stream is enabled by a capability in the materials recycling facility that resorts what the household didn't sort. So it's capital intensive, it's expensive, and our cities and towns and counties are cash strapped for the most part in the United States. You know, GLAD is also a global business and where we've had partnerships with provinces in Canada or other municipal type organizations, we've been able to accomplish so much more quickly around recycling compliance. So actual participation and the cleanliness of streams, which are both important to actually use using the material again, or around composting, which is still very rare in the U.S. A small mid-single digit percentage of households have access to municipal composting facilities in the U.S. And so that is a huge opportunity. And another example where startups can step in and fill the gaps that cities and towns and counties aren't able to invest in today, where they might not want to build their own municipal composting facility, but a startup might be able to pick up from your house, your compostables, and bring them an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours away to a municipal composting facility to help that facility break even and make money for the city that invested in it faster so that we can encourage long-term the spread of those waste stream processors that help make us all more circular in our everyday life. So it is so much education, so much inertia to kind of change 
and I'm glad that GLAD is taking it upon themselves to also bring about change in the consumer behavior. No, absolutely. I'm glad you're glad. And I'm glad that GLAD can play a important role in this. You know, I talked earlier about the role we can play in consumer education, but what shouldn't be dismissed is the role that a large innovative company can play in helping drive consumer adoption even beyond education. So one of the things that we did historically after the Clorox company took over the GLAD business, which we did not start, is we introduced what's now called four Flex technology. And across the marketplace now, there are flex options that are a bigger and bigger portion of the category. Flex makes things work better for consumers. A smaller bag can hold more trash and it can accommodate more, you know, pointy things that used to break bags, don't break bags anymore, especially our force flex. Mm -hmm. But the idea of uh, flex technology actually reduces material usage as well. Um, the bag can be stronger without just being thicker. You know, a dumb bag can get thicker and get stronger, but when you're smart about it, you can get thinner and get stronger and higher performance. And it's our most sustainable bag yet. It's made with 50% recovered plastic and it has 100% recycled packaging. So all of those products are made in our North American manufacturing plants that are certified zero waste to landfill and use 100% renewable energy. So that's one example that's now 15 plus years old that has swept the market based on GLAD's innovative leadership. Another example is around our fragrance technology and our odor control technologies. We have a partnership with Febreze, which you might recognize as an equity from the Procter & Gamble company. And we have technical capabilities that have really made a difference in consumers' willingness to recycle, including their willingness to compost. So our composting bags include odor control. And for those of us who use those, because I compost, when I lived in Chicago, there wasn't municipal composting, but when I moved to Berkeley, California, which offers municipal composting, I started composting. And my first reaction was, this is gross and it's kind of a pain and I don't know what to put in it. GLAD can help solve problems like that. We can make it less gross. Our odor control technology goes a long way. And there are other problems we can solve that make the activity less gross. And even Core Kitchen, as recycling begins to happen, the kitchen trash bag becomes stinkier and wetter. And we can help with that as well, with absorbing odors and making sure that you don't have to waste bags by taking them out three times a week. You can use a trash bag that does odor control using Febreze odor control technology so that your kitchen can smell like a kitchen and smell fresh to you. And you still can exhibit all of these new waste diversion behaviors like recycling and composting and be successful and also happy with your new sustainability lifestyle. Wow, that's quite a path that we have going forward. But if you think about the oil companies like Shell, they have started investing in EV charging stations. Where do you think GLAD would be in that realm? How will you guys change? The oil companies are now moving away from oil, investing in electric charging stations. What do you think would be GLAD's trajectory in the future? That's a great question. And I would say we have, in our sustainability journey, identified four areas, and I've talked about some of them. Product and production, I covered a bit. Packaging, I touched on. And programs, last. What you mentioned here with uh, the diversification of some of the oil companies, I would bucket into these areas of programs. So the Recyclops partnership that I spoke about earlier is a great example of a program that we believe can make a difference in household waste management and reduce the overall footprint of the consumer households that we're trying to enable. Mm -hmm. I also believe that we can continue to up our game in our use of materials, in our use of energy, in the waste streams that come out of our manufacturing facilities. And I believe that we can also have an impact upstream based on the materials that we buy. You know, GLAD's a major purchaser of plastics 
because it's the only material so far that we've found that meets consumer needs the way consumers want their needs met. We're always working on alternative materials like non-virgin plastics, bioplastics, which we have very limited entry but active experimentation in, and other sources of material that solve consumer problems and reduce sustainability footprints in the home. The opportunity to create change in the upstream ecosystem that supplies our markets and create change in the downstream ecosystems that are impacted by our market, consumer behavior in the home, municipality behavior, and the viability of plastics that have been recycled by the consumer but don't find their way yet into reuse. Mm -hmm. All of those are next closer in impacts that we can make as a business uh, to make a dent in this major sustainability challenge that we as a species face and we as a planet face. Mm -hmm. So I believe we can have a major impact as GLAD as a brand in not just educating the consumer and getting our own house in order, but in sending out ripples to those that we buy from and those that we sell to, to help us all get smarter and more connected and more cooperative about having an impact on the environment. That's positive. Wishing you all the best. Thank you so much, Eric, for coming on Mindful Businesses. My pleasure. I appreciate the chance to talk a bit about the impact we believe we're starting to have and the greater impact that GLAD can have on our markets and on the world. Thank you again, Eric, for coming on the show. To learn more about GLAD sustainability efforts, go to glad.com backslash sustainability. You're listening to Mindful Businesses hosted and produced by Vidya Ayer. We'd love to hear from you. Send a voice note with your questions or comments to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. Subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts. If you learned a thing or two from this episode, share it with one friend. We recorded this podcast in Lafayette, Indiana. Theme music was composed by Tatum Gale. Our marketing assistant is Caitlin Milligan. Our advisors are Jim Stone and Anupama Pashricha. This is Vidya Iyer with Mindful Businesses.